united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Today we are going to start Genesis chapter 4. And we always want to remember that in the past, uh, we don't want to trash the past. And instead, we want to learn from the past. We want to learn what the Old Testament has to say. So we're going to start on Genesis 4 today, but let's summarize a little bit about Genesis 1, 2, and 3 so it will make sense. So far, the book of Genesis 1, 2, 3 reveals that God created the universe. Additionally, God designed life on the earth with the capacity to reproduce itself after its own kind. God was involved in his creation, even to the point of him walking in the garden. He was among them. His heart actively was engaged in his design by placing free will within the hearts of Adam and Eve. They had the ability to love the Lord or to separate themselves from him. They had free will. To test this, a forbidden tree was placed in the garden so that they could see their way. Uh, they could choose to go with the Lord or against the Lord. Their volition was there. The task was either to enjoy the Lord and rely upon him or to empower one's conviction that there is bliss and enjoyment without the Lord that would be without the Lord. Adam and Eve initiated an intent to test God, so they fashioned an interest to go against the Lord, ignoring the warning that he declared to them they would die. They knew the consequences of their action, but they decided they'd go for it anyway. Despite their notification of the consequences, they approached the forbidden tree and defiantly they ate the fruit. They knew what they were doing. Instead of becoming a god, they lost their innocence. And guilt forced them to look for something else to wear besides uh, nothing, so fig leaves. They did wrong. And surprisingly, they never did apologize to the Lord. They did not apologize. But they simply blamed each other for their decisions. But they did not apologize to the Lord. This began the fall of mankind. The loving God of the universe was required to undertake action now, and God was forced to take on another role. One of the paramount responsibilities of the Creator is to judge His own creation. He didn't want to, but He had to. They violated His will. To pronounce the highest and the most severe edict against those whom He loved, it broke God's heart to discipline them. He did not want to, but he had to. The Lord removed them from the garden and he placed a sentence of death on his loved ones. Instead of his open love policy, walking in the garden with Adam and Eve, God now had to discipline his creation. God became a, a distant God, always present though, but always allowing man to exercise his free will. Things will be different now. Our Lord will see man's true heart. And even if it hurts our Lord's heart, he is obligated to stand back and allow God's tenderness to be stepped on because he gave them free will and free will must prevail. In general, mankind is allowed to rule planet Earth without God's interference. However, sometimes the Lord will exercise his good nature and intervene in mankind's rebellious nature. Despite all the heartache in human history, the Lord has offered a solution to those who want to follow a better path, a better path. God himself was willing to become a human and take on all the sins of the world. Thereby, our sins can be forgiven now. Renewed fellowship is offered to 
placing our faith in him. Jesus paid the penalty. He paid the, the price. He paid the ticket for our rebellion against God by dying on the cross. Some will want to accept this offer of a new start in life, yet some, they, they will not do it. Now today we're starting here on Genesis chapter 4. And if you look at the slide on Genesis chapter 4, God created the animals and humans not as babies, but as adults. So on the next slide, God's view of babies. For you created my innermost being. You knit it together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full will. Now he continues talking about humanity. My frame was not hidden from you when I made you. In the secret place when I was woven together, your eyes saw my unformed body. God knows about us. He was there at the creation. He was with us. Now look at, look at Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. The designer, the creator had us in mind before we were born. I appointed you with a purpose as a prophet to the nations. This is for Jeremiah. But by application, we all have a purpose. God has a design for us to do, things for us to do. Now, the next slide is the most important slide, I think, for today. The question that comes up is God created everybody as adults. Now he starts with babies. And humanity starts with babies and goes up to adults. What happens if a lady gets hurt? What happens if an injury comes to a pregnant woman? What does the Lord say about this? So Exodus 21, 22 says, When men fight and hurt a pregnant woman so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is not any injury to the baby now. Now for Hebrew, uh, the word uh, baby is uh, he. He means the baby, not the woman. Uh, the baby is not injured. So if the lady is hit, prematurely she delivers the baby but is not hurt, what should happen to the person who did this? Absolutely he, who's he? The one who hurt the woman shall be punished according as her husband who will access a fine upon him and he shall pay as the judge determines. So if the woman is okay, baby is okay, but the baby is born early, then that person who hit the lady, he is obligated to pay a fine as the judge determines what it is. Now, the next slide is about the baby. What about the baby? Exodus 21, 23 to 24 talks about that. Injury to the baby. And if any serious injury occurs to the baby, now what's supposed to happen? Now, Literally, the baby is he. So it's not talking about the woman. It's talking about the baby inside her. It's a masculine pronoun indicating the baby, not the mother, which is feminine. Ason is the Hebrew word. Ason means injury. So let's try and put that first part together now. If any serious injury occurs to the baby, then the punishment must match the injury. So it is saying if something happens to the baby, whatever happens, does it pass away? Does it, if it dies, gets injured, an eye, tooth, whatever, it, it gets hurt, then the punishment must match the injury to the baby. What happened to the baby? A life for life. Oh, a life for life, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot or foot. Well, what is the Bible trying to tell us here? If the guy who injured the lady and the baby comes out and the baby is dead or injured, then there is a punishment for the person that injured the woman. Well, what is the punishment? A life for a life, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot or foot. Punishment to the one who caused the baby to be aborted, to be injured, it is a life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, must equal the injury that the baby had. 
whatever happened to the baby, uh, that injury has to go to the person who did it. So, with this in mind, if, if someone aborts a baby and goes in there and takes it away, this applies. Then the punishment must match the injury, a life for a, a, a life. Or if it's bored okay uh, and there's just injury to the, to the baby, then whatever happens to it, that must be paid by the person who did that. So the Lord is telling us that he is against abortion totally. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now innocence is gone now. Adam and Eve sinned. Innocence is taken away. And so life is there without God. Uh, he is not present directly. He is there indirectly, of course. It's a different world now. So she has two kids, two boys. Now on the next slide, I'm not sure where they got this picture. Look at that picture. Different characteristics emerge. Baby Cain, hot-headed. That little baby looks really hot-headed there. On the other side is his younger brother, Abel. He is calm. He's collected. He's cool. Both came from the same parents. One is a hothead and one is a cool, collected uh, baby. They grow up. Now Abel kept flocks, so his occupation was a shepherd. And Cain worked the soil. He is a farmer. Now it's easy to remember this because Cain is grown out in a field and a farmer would take care of it. So you can remember Cain as a crop equals farmer. So here they are. They're grown boys now. The Lord has a, 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 I don't know, a sacrifice, I guess you'd call it. Uh, the best way we can look at it is like Christmas time. It is time to bring a present. So in this time, they were both supposed to bring a present to the Lord. So in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but he brought second best. He did not bring the first best from his crop. On the other hand, Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his crop, the best of his offering. So the oldest son brought second best. Uh, the youngest son brought the first best from his uh, sheep. Now Cain and Abel is what we'll talk about next. The two brothers. Remember, innocence is gone. Adam and Eve decided they wanted to be their own gods to do it their own way. Now we're seeing the first kids that they had and see how it went. So in the next slide, nope, let me tell you a story first. I'm sorry. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, and the illustration is about a true football player named Gerald McCoy. He was a defensive tackle for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. McCoy was the third pick overall in the 2010 NFL draft. He's six foot four and he weighs 295 pounds. Two times he was the first team All-American college uh, player. Two times he was the first team All-Big 12 college player. He was the USA Today defensive player in the year 2005. He was the Oklahoma Gator player of the year. He knows all about football and playing sports. McCoy and the Buccaneers agreed to a five-year contract, $63 million contract on July the 31st, 2010. When Gerald McCoy was an Oklahoma defense tackle, he knew a thing or two about life. In the state of Oklahoma, football is the way of life. Growing up in a nearby Oklahoma City, Gerald had the same dreams that so many other young boys have, and that is football glory. Every young boy's dream is to play for the Oklahoma Sooners. Gerald McCoy is a man among boys. This All-American was a captain on the number one college football team in the country. It's passion of mine, he says, is I feel God put me there to do that, to play football. I just love playing football. By the time he reached high school, Gerald was among the elite football recruits in the nation. Despite growing up in a Christian 
with Christian parents, Gerald was no stranger to living on the wild side. Even though he lived in a Christian family, he was wild. I was his freshman high school player, he says, starting out with the varsity guys. So going to the parties, going here and being there, doing this and doing that was what people expected of me. Soon, Gerald found out he would have to grow up fast. I found out I was going to have a child. The end of my junior year of high school, and she was born two days before National Signing Day, my senior year. Gerald's parents were concerned for their son's future. I didn't know what it meant to be a father. I was just 17 years old, he said. All I worried about in high school was playing video games. I was in the middle of being recruited by colleges, and my parents told me, you have to grow up now. We'll help you, but you've got to gradually start learning to be a man. With his parents' support, Gerald decided to take the scholarship offered by the University of Oklahoma. But his arrival in Norman was anything but happy. I didn't know what it was like to play because I played every year. When football season is in, I'm supposed to be playing. I was on the team, but I wasn't playing. I was just, it was just eating me alive. I was not on the first string. I didn't make it. So I called my mother and I said, look, mom, I don't know if I can do this anymore. With the guidance of his mother, Gerald made it through the season. That summer, he was doing well enough in practice to be a starter once again. That's when he would face the biggest tragedy of his life. When his parents were visiting for Father's Day, his mother suffered a brain aneurysm. Three weeks later, she passed away without his mom. Gerald was without the biggest guiding force in his life. Mom's gone now. What do I do? The anger forced him to cry out to God. I let the anger out. Probably a week later, Gerald said, we had already had the funeral, and I came home and I told my dad, I said, Daddy, I can't take this anymore. I just got to say what I got to say. God knows how I feel, but I just got to say it. I yelled at God. I was angry. I was hitting the walls. I could not understand why my mother had to be taken away. Why, God? Anything else could have happened, but why, God, did you take my mother away? God, I don't like it. I never will like it. I will never understand it. But... You are still the ruler. If you allowed this to happen to me, Lord, then I know I can make it, Gerald declared. Even in spite of the heartache and the tribulation and the trials, he gave it to the Lord. You know, when a crisis comes in our life, God will get us through the incident. Give it to him. Allow God to work in your heart. Trust in the Lord. But now back to Genesis, Cain, he would not listen to God like Gerald did, the football player. Anger controlled the situation, the criticism. The Lord took with favor, looked on favor with Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor because it was second best. Instead of bringing the best crop, he brought the, the rotten tomato, the second best. And the Lord made a judgment. God wants us to do our best. Abel brought the best. A lamb sacrificed the best lamb. But his older brother Cain brought the second best. The quality suffered. But the Lord said, this is how God looks at us. But the Lord said, do not look at his appearance for God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord, uh, he looks at the heart. God sees the intent of the heart. He sees our emotions. If you look at the sign on the right, 
Anger is only one letter short of danger. Just put the D on there and you have danger for anger. Now, a, a, a lady got real upset. Let me tell you another story, another uh, incident. After a man ran off with another woman, her husband ran off with another woman. He contacted his wife and told her to sell the new Cadillac and send him the money. She promptly placed an ad in the newspaper for sale. New Cadillac, $75. A gentleman called and inquired about the ad. Just $75? He wanted to know what was wrong with the car. She said, nothing. I'm just following what my husband ordered me to do. Sell the car and send the money. So he's only going to get $75. He took off with another woman. Now back in Genesis, when something happens to us, you can become angry like the lady or you can allow God to work things out. Uh, criticism leads to a compliant or defiant conduct. Do we say, okay, Lord, I can go through it if you guide me or why did you do that to me? So Cain was angry. No, Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why? Are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Why do you look so terrible? Why didn't you just say, I'm sorry, and bring the, the better uh, uh, fruit next time? No. Why, instead, why, why are you upset? Why are you angry? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Why didn't you do it right the first time? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. His desire is to have you, but you must master it. So what it is talking about is if you do wrong and you let the anger continue, it goes to revenge, to wrath, and to some kind of other action. Instead, if you would just leave it alone, let it go away. Now, sin is personified here as a monster. You open the door, that sin monster is going to get you. Your anger is going to increase. Cain never apologized to God at all. He wouldn't do it. Sin is ready to spring into action. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Is the sin going to control you with anger or are you going to control it and master it? The Lord advocates that we have the ability to master it. Now, let me give you another illustration. An eagle swooped down and picked up a weasel in its powerful talons, but when it flew over the lake, the wings unexplainably went limp, and the eagle went crashing down. The weasel had bitten into the attacker in the midair, killing the uh, eagle. When we uh, bring anger close to us, like he brought his his victim uh, to him that bit him, when we bring that anger, that frustration close to us, when we cling to anger, it's going to bite us. It's going to bite us like he bit the eagle. And when it bites us, uh, when we least expect the bite to happen, when it does happen, uh, it may take us down. It is better to confront the situation confront the anger and let it go and say, Lord, it is in your hands. Now, if you look at the next slide here, don't open the door. Don't open that door. Hey, I wouldn't open that door if I were you. Now, look what it says above the door. Temptation. Don't enter. On the other side is this monster, this huge creature called sin. You open the door and you keep your anger going. It's going to jump on you and it will be your master. Underneath the picture, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Just do what's right. And if you make a mistake, just apologize, Lord, forgive me. But if you do not do what is right, sin, personification, is crouching at the door, is desires to have you. But you must master it. You have to do that. Now, the next slide, is it this, this is a great sign from a farmer, a safety tip, warning. Farmer safety tip, stay away from farmer's daughter. As a warning, you stay away from my daughter or you're going to get it. 
In the next slide, what we have here is safety tips. Beware. There's always somebody who does not like you. There's always somebody who goes in the wrong direction. So if you look on the left side, pornography kills. Pornography doesn't help. It kills. Drugs. Drugs don't help you. They will kill you. They'll kill your lifestyle. Below that, envy. If you're envious of somebody, it will destroy your life. In the middle, below, no jealousy allowed. You let that jealousy take you over, it will pull you down. The emotional door kills you if you just run your life by emotions instead of the facts of the Bible. Revenge, you just can't wait to go get them. It will, uh, it will uh, capture you. And then above that is drinking. Uh, drinking will kill you if you have that in, in your occupation. Now look at the wedding there. All the, the bridesmaids behind the, the, the bride. Look at their looks. Their looks are killing. Okay, the looks are killing the situation. So why let your anger control you? Instead, let it go. Don't let that monster captivate you and take you. Don't do that. Now the next slide, overcome it. Resist. Repent. And practice righteousness. Overcome. Access denied. You can't go down this route of anger. It will destroy you. The burden of sin will captivate you. You cannot do that. Anger, hostility may generate rage and revenge. Innocence portrayed. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. He acted so innocent. He was going to take his brother out and to the field. So next time, we'll go into a little bit more detail about this. But right now, let's have a prayer. Lord, you are talking about our character. And you say that each and every one of us will have a difficulty in life. There will be something that will happen that will make us unhappy. How do we handle it? Do we allow you to handle it? Or do we go against what happened and take it in our own hands and want revenge? But revenge will destroy us. It will take us down. So, Lord, as we get confronted with situations, teach us once again to do what is right and trust you. You are our Lord and you are our Savior. You love us and you will take care of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.